What's up, everybody? Matt Browse here of Pohada Photography, and welcome back to the Pohada Podcast, the second episode utilizing video. So check it out on YouTube, the Pohada Podcast. This time around, it's another BSing with a black belt episode, yet another judo black belt who's also a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. This one is a surprisingly focused episode as we get into a lot of judo, a lot of jiu jitsu how they meld, what would work between the two, and a lot of his coaching philosophy. That's the key word, philosophy. We start with that. My man here is a professor of philosophy. So a big thinker and a clear talker, without further ado, my conversation with D. M. Hutchinson. We call him Danny. What's your name? Uh, My name is Danny Joseph Munoz Hutchinson. Uh, I go by D.M. Hutchinson professionally, however. D.M. D.M. Hutchinson. Like a D.H. Lawrence, but a D.M. Hutchinson. (laughs) Put yourself in good company. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Where are you from, bro? I'm from California, San Francisco Bay Area. What the hell are you doing out here, Minnesota? Uh, The job. Of course. I'm an academic, so I go where there are jobs. Uh, so this is where I secured a tenure track position after I finished my PhD. Oh, sweet. First, yeah. first gig then? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I taught in grad school, sure. um, but this was my first full-time gig. Where yeah. at, if you don't mind saying? Grad school? Or uh, the, the gig. Bay Area. The gig. The gig. Oh, I, I'm a professor at St. Olaf College. Oh, nice. I think, I think you told me that, actually. Yeah, I'm yeah. a professor of philosophy and department chair. What does that mean? Which one? Let's start with the word philosophy. What, is that? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, 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 well, <laughs> is that a how much time you got question? <laughs> yeah. um, well, let's see. Etymologically, it means the love of wisdom, right? Um, but what it means differs depending upon which philosopher you're talking about, which era you're talking about, which cultural tradition you're talking about. Generally speaking, I'm a specialist in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. I tend to be Socratic in my orientation towards philosophy. So I tend to think of philosophy in the terms that Socrates defined it, which is to say it was um, a, a way of life devoted to examining oneself and others uh, for the purpose of living happily, living meaningfully, et cetera, et cetera. Such a good answer. <laughs> it could be wrong. It could be total fluff and nonsense, but it sounded good. Okay, well, that's what I. At like. least it sounds yeah. good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why? Why? Why do I study philosophy? Why, why are you into it? What What draws you to that? Uh, I think it's because I was raised from a very early age to value philosophy. So I didn't have a traditional upbringing. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. Neither of them made it past the tenth grade. And my moral and religious upbringing was in Asian martial arts. So my father uh, understood the importance of the philosophical foundation to martial arts. And he used to often tell me to pay attention to the philosophy whenever we were watching, you know, kung fu movies or karate movies. Sure. (laughs) Because he didn't have a formal education, but he knew it was important. And his way of identifying it for me was, okay, you see this scene in Enter the Dragon? You see, like, the old guy talking to Bruce Lee? (laughs) Pay attention to what he's saying, right? right? And then I also always knew that, like, ah, this stuff about following the way, they're not being a self, they're only being technique. I've always sensed that, ah, this is what's really important behind martial arts training. I really wish I would have planned that as a segue question. (laughs) So that leads you then in your own formal education to go full deep on philosophy yeah 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 but it was a kind of a roundabout way yeah because i for sure in college i was really interested in mythology for a while and then i started realizing that i wasn't really interested in mythology as such but i was really interested in a branch of philosophy called metaphysics this is a kind of a more theoretical branch concerned with questions about what's real or what's fundamental and then i worked my way back to the greeks and so then for about a decade i was only focused on ancient greek and roman philosophy and then i sort of rediscovered the asian philosophical tradition uh while developing new courses at saint olaf college so i started off with asian philosophy early on 
and then I've returned to it in my my middle years, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's real? What's real? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, de- <laughs> it depends. Realizing on, what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, who you ask. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, that definition is up for grabs. You know, nowadays, sometimes people think that uh, what's real is, uh, is, is virtual as much as what's real in the, in the sense that of what we can see, touch, smell, taste, hear, etc. So the definition of reality is changing and morphing in interesting ways. You say you came back to, like, did you say Eastern or Japanese philosophies relating to martial arts? Mm-hmm. When did you start training in martial arts? I started training in martial arts when I was old enough to walk. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, officially, I started when I was five. Right. Uh, but I grew up on the mat. My yeah. father did judo uh, on Travis Air Force Base. So he grew up on a military base and did judo. And so it's what he knew more than anything. So I was raised on the mat. Judo from the beginning and judo only? No, it was also karate. So sure. I was, did karate and judo, like very traditional Japanese martial arts. Sure. Um, and then you know, as a teenager, I kickboxed and did other things. But I think in my heart, I've always been a grappler. I've yeah. always enjoyed that more. Judo seems real. It's very definitely real. You can't question reality when you're throwing somebody. There's there's no doubts. Especially on the landing part. Yeah. That seems very real. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So do you have like a lineage or a school to the judo? Or did you end yeah. up kind of... Yeah, you know, it's not... In judo, mm-hmm. one, the, the whole concept of a lineage is, is not as important in judo as it is in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. A couple other people have said that on here, that it's, I mean, judo's judo. You just yeah. you train judo, and it's then like, they train can judo. can you perform or can you not? That's really sure. what matters. Sure. Uh, like, can you perform and are you a good person? I would say those two things are what matters in judo. Um, but, I mean, I started my judo training at the International Judo Karate and Aikido School in Oakland, California. And my original structure instructor was a man by the name of Walter Todd. He was a significant figure way back in the day because he got all of his rank from Japan. So he was like a legitimate American who learned uh, martial arts in Japan and brought it to the United States. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he was the first American to have a karate school in the mainland. So he was sort of a big name in the history sure. of martial arts. And then um, I did uh, judo under him for a number of years. I did judo in Amador Judo and Jiu-Jitsu Club in Livermore, California for a long time. In grad school, I did judo with the Philadelphia Judo Club and the Mainline Judo Club. And then when I got to Minnesota, I um, did judo at the Midway Judo Club with uh, Kerry Yamanaka, a uh, very mm-hmm. good instructor. And then a few years, uh, actually not a few years ago, it's probably like eight, nine years ago now, I started the judo club and ran at the academy. So I was the head judo coach at the academy for about five or six years. So how long have you been in Minnesota then? I've been in Minnesota for maybe uh, 11 years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whenever I first meet someone, <clears throat> I assume they're completely new. Uh-huh. So I was like, yeah, who's this guy? <laughs> so he said, yeah, I moved here from California. I'm like, yeah, it must have been a few months ago. Just, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, a childlike brain, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you, do you formally teach or coach judo now? Um, now I only offer private lessons and or private lesson exchanges. Um, I don't have the time to run a club or really teach uh, consistently uh, because of my, my workload. Yeah. Yeah. I had to step down as the uh, head coach of the academy because, uh, I took on the role as department chair at St. Olaf college. Uh, and I was commuting to Northfield on the one hand and then commuting to Brooklyn Center on the other hand to run the judo program. And I had a small child and I was like, well, this is not doable. Right. So yeah. I had something had to go. Easy, obvious balancer is yeah. chop the hobby. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or the, Continue the training in jiu-jitsu, yeah. but like I can't, I can't be responsible for a curriculum and promoting people and right. filling out forms and renewing certifications and things like yeah. that. Doing that. Much. On the other side, plenty. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, I get plenty of that at the school. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been training jujitsu then? Uh, you know, it depends on what you mean by train, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Because yeah. um, when I was in Philadelphia, uh, the judo club I trained at um, uh, was housed in a facility at which there was a prominent jujitsu team, and the instructor, the judo instructor, was a brown belt in Brazilian jujitsu, and he incorporated lots of jujitsu into our nawaza. 
and the judo practices at the Philadelphia Judo Club were first hour mat work. So a half hour technique, half hour rolling, second hour uh, stand up work, half hour technique, half hour rondori. So I did a lot of jiu-jitsu informally as part of my judo in my early 30s. Um, but I've probably only been doing jiu-jitsu as an art form in itself for about maybe six, seven years. Sure, sure. Yeah. Formally. Yeah, formally. Yeah. 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 Where, where's most of that training been? Uh, the academy. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, and now M-Theory. Sure, so, yeah. sure. Do you, do you, there's still a lot of commuting, bro. Like... Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, no, yeah, Northfield to anywhere in yeah. the Twin Cities, you're yeah. officially on the long commute side. Yeah, but I only do it two to three days per week, and yeah. it's reverse commute. Oh, heading out, heading home. Yeah, and you know, I'm only there. I'm only on campus maybe eight months out of the year because summer's off, breaks right. off. So it's not That's bad. Right. That's right. What do you like better, judo in the sport definition sense, mm-hmm. or jujitsu? understanding that there's it's really tough yeah yeah I, I i suppose i as a sport i like judo better i think it's more exciting to practice and it's more exciting to watch um but i also really love brazilian jiu-jitsu for sure yeah I've... there's no there, not no there seems to be very minimal flash mm-hmm. to brazilian jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. whereas like a lot of flash to judo mm-hmm. Well, I guess it depends on who you ask, right? Some people are really flashy. Their techniques are really good. I'm thinking from the common man perspective, uh-huh. I guess. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I are, tune yeah. in to and Hodger and Bouchesha and someone tells me he's the two greatest of all time. Yeah. And I watch that whole match and yeah. I go, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know. Whereas I watch two high level judo guys mm-hmm. for whom I don't even have names. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's going to splash. Yeah. It's yeah. going to flash. I guess at like the base level. Yeah. One of those is sexy. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It's it's Hail Mary throw is yeah. what it looks like. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You see a lot of aggression, a lot of movement. Uh yeah. You see someone dynamic. get hit with a planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, versus wrist locked or yeah. whatever. I yeah. Mean, yeah. It's terrifying. Mm. Judo's violent poetry. Yeah, I suppose that's a way of characterizing it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, worry. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah, there it's aggressive and it's forceful. It's dynamic. Um uh there's a lot of power involved, a lot of physicality, but it's also very graceful and technical. So that's this what, what I, I mean by judo. the poetry. The poetry, like... yeah. That's yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does one go about starting training in judo? Uh, like, let's say a bunch of jujitsu people listen to this, mm-hmm. which is true, mm-hmm. which means they're judo curious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a default. Like, okay, if we yeah. if we started standing, what would I do? Okay, yeah. let's not start standing, and they sit yeah. down and they and they go yeah. from there. Yeah. Uh, what like what's like the fundamental? I mean, obviously, go find a coach or a program mm-hmm. and and be taught judo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, what would my focus be? You know, I'm pretty traditional, um, and I think uh, an important part of being comfortable doing judo is knowing how to fall. So if you can learn how to fall properly, uh, you'll protect yourself whenever you take falls, and so you won't get injured. And importantly, if you know how to fall, you'll fully commit to your throws. See, most people are afraid of coming in for throws because it involves exposing their back. And the moment they expose their back, the system of their inner ear starts to worry about falling. And so do they do everything they can not to fall. It's natural. So what you have to do is be comfortable with falling so that you can fully commit to your throws and turn your back to your opponent and know that whatever happens, you're going to survive it. And then you can fully commit to your throw. So I say, like, learn how to fall, then start learning how to do throws. Most people do the reverse. They never learn how to fall, and they just start doing throws. Um, And that's why they don't progress as throwers. That's a really awesome answer. <laughs> I suppose it's it, is it exacerbated if I have a couple years of jujitsu of being frightened of giving up my back and doing everything to not have somebody on my back. Possibly, because yeah. you're saying it's like a human instinct. Like mm-hmm. I don't want to 
tip over. Yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, your inner ear, the system yeah. of your inner ear uh, does everything it can uh, to prevent you from falling. Right. So like when you fall, the reason why you reach out, right, is because your inner ear is telling the rest of your body, don't fall. Mm -hmm. So you have to retrain your brain so that you can become comfortable with falling. Sure. So when I fumble into a drop, say, Onagi, mm -hmm. and then I have a another 300 pound dude <laughs> straddling my back and yeah. choking me out yeah i should have just gone faster that's what you're saying well you should have uh you jump uh, more close in between his legs yeah and just not go for that <laughs> yeah, I you're probably just... not going to be a drop zoe player yeah no yeah. it's not a lot of room yeah to work yeah I really like that explanation. It's sort of like, I guess that was kind of what I was hoping for too, is what is like the fundamental thought process that mm -hmm. either isn't there or should be there. Mm -hmm. Cause you, just like everybody looks into anything, you look into BMX riding mm -hmm. and your instinct is, all right, I get a bike and build a jump and mm -hmm. now I'm going to go off this jump. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, was there stuff I should think about first? Yeah. And obviously yeah. falling needs to be the first thing. Yeah, I had a I little bit of, of, uh, Aikido years and years mm -hmm. ago, like six months or something yeah. like that. And I remember you know, spending all this time, hours and hours and hours, learning how to tip over. Yeah. Like learning how to land, how to yeah. fall. Yeah. And yeah. watching people not come back mm -hmm. for the next class because mm -hmm. of that. And it just, it seemed really silly. It seemed like, okay, if we're going to be throwing each other, mm -hmm. odds are we want to be good at this part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You people should stay. Yeah. And, and continue with this. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, my, generally mine is um, learn how to fall correctly. It's it's like falling is the least fun part of judo, and it's kind of boring, especially like on day one when you're just practicing falls for a half an hour. You can lose people because they want to do the exciting thing, but it's in their long term interest to to be comfortable with falling, both so that they don't get injured and so that they can be confident throwers. It's, it's probably the first thing I did when I joined up at jiu-jitsu, too. Mm -hmm. Like, day one involved a throw. So day yeah. one involved certain drills, at least in the warm-up yeah. for the day, to familiarize yeah. my body with, with the process of falling. Yeah. Is there, do you have any extrapolated, uh, like, philosophical or mythological metaphors for that for that for for that? learning to fall before you can fight or something like uh... that? <laughs> No, not to put no. you on the spot. <laughs> no, I just think that like, so one thing that's unique about judo is like the commitment to a throw. It's like if you go to a judo match, a judo tournament, not everybody's fast, not everybody's strong, not everybody's technical. Um, but when people come in for throws and they land them, they're fully committed to executing them. This is also why. You, um, you'll hear me key eye at, at mm -hmm. end theory mm -hmm. is because it's, it's, it's an expression of my commitment to the technique, right? I'm giving all of myself and then some to executing it. And so in judo, like you're really, really committed when you execute successfully a technique. Yeah. And so being comfortable with falling is an important step in being able to fully commit yourself to something because when you come in for a throw and you expose your back there's this one thing like okay i don't want to expose my back i could get drowned back dragged backwards and there's another thing okay i've come in and now i'm encountering resistance do i continue with the throw or do i retreat and if you're uncomfortable with falling chances are you're going to retreat and you're not going to continue with the throw so I think of it as just like part of this, the steps of becoming fully committed to your technique. Sure. We're sinking into our chairs here. Oh, okay. I'm now sinking into yeah, my chair. Yeah, it's legitimately, uh, like, you know, they just have to slouch a little. All right. Uh, I think my... Uh, hesitation with any throws would be the same as my hesitation with any of the jujitsu stuff which is i don't want to hurt anybody mm -hmm. i know i'm not going to yeah but it all just feels so rude yeah judo looks really rude yeah that's another thing a lot of jujitsu people are they're very worried they're very worried about getting hurt by a judo throw and they're also very worried about hurting others by a judo throw yeah and again i think this is partly because they don't know how to fall correctly 
They just don't have the repetitions yeah. of, of... They don't know how to fall correctly, and they don't know how to throw somebody in a way that promotes them falling safely. Like, for instance, when I throw you, I can do it in one of two ways. I can chuck you so that you land flat on your back, and you potentially knock the wind out of yourself. Bro, two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Not or, you. Yeah. Somebody did. Or I can pull up gently on your sleeve so that you fall on your side in a yeah. much more comfortable side fall. Chances are if you if you do the latter, the person's not gonna get hurt. You're reversing the pressure a little bit. It's yeah. kind of decelerating them on the way. Yeah, down. exactly. It's yeah. kind of like a deceleration, yeah. 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 I've so, I've uh, doing some of the little hip throws that we do. Mm-hmm. I've straight caught my uke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I've straight caught my uke and just uh. pulled them back up. <laughs> like Which, midair. Yeah. I mean, you get lined up with a smaller dude, it yeah. just seems sort of polite. Just yeah. catch them at about my <laughs> knees like... and then just pull them back up. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Usually gets a good laugh. And it's also like, hey, thanks, bud. You yeah. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. One yeah. less landing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also something that happens. You'll see people, they'll throw and they'll kind of hang on to their partner mm-hmm. to soften the landing. Mm-hmm. But you're really doing your partner mm-hmm. and yourself a disservice. Yeah. You just need to learn how to throw properly and, yeah. and, and all will be well. Yeah. How many hours does that take? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Not too long. I, I teach a course at St. Olaf called Zen in the Art of Judo. And this is a course I teach over January term. And it meets five days a week, two hours a day. And it's just for the month of January. And I get the students um, up and running fairly quickly. Uh, so by the third day, they're already learning their first throw. And by the end of the month, they've learned eight throws. And they can do them fairly well. They can get to the, the level of proficiency that a, an adult yellow belt would be at by the end of the month because it's so intensive. Sure. Yeah. So I think if you're doing it intensively and you have a minimal degree of athleticism and physical comfort landing, um, <laughs> it, it can be pretty quick. Sure. That's yeah. incredibly encouraging to hear for a lot of people, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Something tells me it's in a lot of people's head where it's like, all right, in 10 years, I'm going to be pretty crisp at judo. <laughs> you know, no. is that how, that's how jujitsu tends to feel too, where you're yeah. like, all right, in 10 years from now, that guy will still be beating me. <laughs> yeah. What's your uh, favorite throw? In judo? Yeah, you got one. Uh, my favorite throw in judo is called uchimata, which is a, an inner thigh uh, reap. And... Um, do you know what I'm talking about, Uchi Mata? Nope. Try, okay. try, try to visualize So it. imagine uh, imagine me grabbing my uke with my right hand over his um, over his back and mm-hmm. what's called the power grip. Mm-hmm. Imagine with my left hand, I'm grabbing his sleeve. Mm-hmm. I step in, rotate, and I throw my leg in between his legs, high up into the air. So his feet go right up over his head. So it's a it's a it's a way of attacking against somebody where you you spring up from underneath them and you execute the throw by the power of your reap, which just goes right up between their legs. And I like the throw because um, to me it's the perfect combination of um, force and uh, technique or force and grace. Let's just call it those two: force and grace. It's very powerful, very aggressive, very physical, but it's also one of the most beautiful techniques because it's a technique in which your body is fully extended, yeah, almost like a ballerina. Open. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's beautiful to witness. Is that the one I, I got a picture of you doing with Marcus? No, that's Osoto Gari. That was Osoto? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, dang. <laughs> so I think I've got the picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uchimata is really great. It's really, really great. It's a very popular throw in tournaments. Least favorite? Least favorite throw. Or uh, less favorite, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have... I kind of like them all. I kind of like them all. I'm not into, like... I don't know. I'm not so big anymore. Um, but I've always been more into, like, big guy judo, what is called power judo. I like the big, powerful throws where you land on your partner. So any kind of throw that's, like, kind of, like, designed to just score a minimal point so that you get ahead on points, um, I'm a little less interested in those. Sure. Is, is there a just advantage to those two styles that you kind of alluded to mm-hmm. in, like, a judo tournament or even maybe in a jiu-jitsu tournament? You say you like big yeah. guy throws where you're going to kind of land on top yeah. of them. It's, that seems, in my mm. 
dumb guy brain mm-hmm. that that would be adv- advantageous. It is because one of the ways you win in judo is by scoring a nippon as a first a full point. So if you throw yourself on top of your partner with control and power, chances are the match will be over. And one of the things I like about that is if you were to do that in a real situation, in a fight, for instance, and you threw somebody with full force, you landed on top of them, and you were uh, positionally advantageous in doing so, you would probably end the fight quickly or at least put yourself in a much better position to do so. That's kind of, that was kind of my takeaway. Yeah. I was like, it's, I want to be on top. I feel like that's right where I want to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come in for a, a back sacrifice throw on the street. You sure. Know? So I'm, yeah. Why would I want to build a game around it? You know, on the mat. What do you think of judo in terms of uh, self defense teachings or self defense thoughts? Well, you know, it depends on the person and the dojo. Um, some are very sport oriented. Others are self defense oriented. Um, but I mean, I think judo teaches you a lot about how to fight. I mean, just the physicality of it, the timing, the distance, uh, the generation of force, uh, the knowledge of position on the feet and on the bottom that goes a long way in a self-defense situation. Just balance. Balance. Yeah. Like if balance, you, you yeah. watch these terrible videos online of mm. people getting in fights and they're just randomly tipping over like, <laughs> you're yeah. like 25 years old. Yeah. Why is your balance so bad? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think judo can be very effective. I mean, you don't learn how to block punches or block kicks or throw knees or elbows. Um, but, it, you know, if it was a person who's done a lifetime in judo versus somebody who's never done anything, I think the judoka is going to do better at a self-defense situation. Well, six months of judo yeah. against somebody who's never done anything. I yeah. Mean, even yeah. a hint of how to defend yourself yeah. seems better than nothing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if some if you, if you're experiencing an attack and you and you tie up a person, you know, instinct will will kick in and the throw will likely happen. So is there a list of um, throws that would be my go-to list to learn if I was learning judo for the sake of my jiu-jitsu competition? Oh, if you were doing it for that reason, it would depend on your body type. So like the techniques you learn in judo are really dependent on your body type, your physical abilities, and I would say your personality, right? This is about, and it's similar in jiu-jitsu, like, If you want to develop a game, right, you want to pick techniques that um, are expressive of those sorts of things, right? So you're a big guy. Um, So, you know, you would want to pick techniques that work with your body type and that work with what you like to do in jiu-jitsu. What do you want to set up? Yeah. Yeah. I want to be on top. (laughs) So maybe maybe I'm not the best example. Let's say a smaller smaller guy. Yeah. Yeah. and they like to play like a guard pass game. Yeah, yeah. So I just need my guy to hit the ground. I don't need to be on them. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't need to have yeah. lifted them up, thrown yeah. them, and slammed them. I yeah. just need them to the ground yeah, so I can pass you'll... their guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. There I would have a list of, of throws yeah. in mind. Yeah. Give me like a hypothetical couple examples. Yeah. Um. So, you know, like I've been working with Marcus for about six months now. And uh, for instance, and he's smaller. Pull that in a little oh, yeah. bit. Yeah. Smaller, very technical. Yeah. Um, so I've been working with him on Yoko Tomoinage, which I think is one of the best throws, crossover throws for jiu-jitsu, because it's a side sacrifice technique that works well and sets up a lot of jiu-jitsu techniques. Um, and then I've been working with him on Ochigari and Kochigari, like um, um, major and minor inner reaps. Like basically, like you can think of it as like foot sweeps inside of the legs. And if you do either Ochi or Kochi, the person lands and they land in such a way that their legs are spread open wide, sitting right basically beneath you, and you're right in a position to start passing guard with knee slice passes or whatever mm-hmm. you want. Mm-hmm. So you could just use Ochigari and Kochigari as your primary takedowns to basically get somebody on their butt with their legs spread open, and then you can run whatever passing game you want. So you don't yeah. need to do the, like the very like – taxing throws that require lots of energy like you know um like a ogoshi or a harai goshi or maybe an osotogari these kind of big power movements you know the rules of jiu-jitsu don't incentivize going for the big throw so if you want just a small throw so that your partner will be on their butt you'll get ahead on points different types of foot sweeps are really good for that regard i was just going to actually ask you about foot sweeps Mm. because within the violent poetry that Mm. is judo foot sweeps seem like the pure 
uh-huh. beautiful poetry yeah. of it. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. the lowest effort, yeah. the lowest energy on mm-hmm. my end, and the least risk too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, foot sweeps are beautiful because, as you say, it's it's low effort and then also it's low risk, and then you get the same reward. So you don't have to expend a lot. It's not like shooting a power double. Like, no matter how good you are, I mean, if you shoot a power double on somebody, you expend a lot of energy, yeah. right? Or if you come in for a big hurayagoshi in judo, like a sweeping hip throw, you expend a lot of energy. But when you do, when you execute a foot sweep, it's very little energy. You, it's, it's all based on timing. It's not based on speed. It's mm-hmm. just timing. And then you're dragging your partner's foot about maybe six inches in the direction they're already walking, ideally when they don't know it. And so it just, boom. The throw happened, and now they're just splayed out in front of you, and you can just get into whatever positional. Uh, they look accidental. Want to get into? It. Yeah, they look accidental. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> the first few times I ever saw, I was like, "Is that what they were trying to do?" Yeah, yeah. But and there's no chance of them sprawling and smashing your face into the true. Ground yeah, exactly. Like yeah, on a power double. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you either hit it or you don't. And mm-hmm. It could be bad at that point where you just try another split sweep. It yeah, seems like. exactly. That's, you know? that's, that's one of the things I like about it. It's like, I don't like shooting singles or doubles in part because I don't like putting my head in that position and setting myself in such a way that somebody can just sprawl on me. I just don't. I just don't like that feeling. Sure. And I don't like the tactics of it. I'm not. I'm not a good enough wrestler to so sure. like wrestle myself out of it. So if I can just manage my distance to keep you away from me and foot sweep, foot sweep you with a little effort i'd much rather do that same <laughs> but it's exclusively because i'm lazy <laughs> different different motivating factors uh we we kind of um, something tells me that we'll get a little repetition on your answer to this but there's a thing i do when i get brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt in here mm-hmm. and you are a judo black belt mm-hmm. um and I asked them, this is going to have to be a two-part thing. I asked them to give advice for people at each level. And we just go with the belt ranks for the sake of simplicity. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So okay. like, all right, all right, you're sitting across from a white belt, let's say. Mm-hmm. What's the generalized, maybe even elevator pitch advice you mm-hmm. give them? Same thing, blue belt, same thing. Mm-hmm. So first, mm-hmm. give me the rundown on the belt system in judo. Mm-hmm. And two, some version of advice for each level of that mm-hmm. interesting that's an interesting question i like that because um, isn't there like three brown belt levels yeah there are three grades of brown belt yeah, okay like yeah. sankyu eq and niku yeah 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 <laughs> so in for the adult ranking i don't i don't i can't keep up with the kids rankings uh, in part because it's 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 changed quite a lot like my daughter is five and she's training at grappler station with max kafka and um she was promoted from her white belt to her white belt with a yellow stripe right mm-hmm. and so the little kids have so many stripes uh so i'll only comment on the adults so thank you <laughs> basically white belt yellow belt green belt three grades of brown and then black so um, the white well, they belt. kind of slow you down before you get to feel awesome. There, like, all right, I'm a brown belt. Next is black. Nope, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, generally speaking, at the white belt level, I think you should you should learn how to fall. Learn to fall. I yeah. think that's yeah. really important. That's yeah. kind of what I figured. You're yeah, you say. don't want to be you don't want to be a brown belt and not know how to fall. That's not gonna that's not it, gonna be good. It seemed like it would be analogous to okay, you're a white belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. Get used to hiding your elbows, yeah. tucking your chin, yeah. and maybe even escaping. Yeah, escaping. Yeah. Fighting grips yeah. and escaping, like yeah. survive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think that's right. Um, so learning how to fall at the white belt level, uh, and I think learning how to pin, I think, is quite important. Tell me what you mean. Like, so one of the ways you can win in judo is by pinning. So there are four ways you can win: throwing, pinning choking or, or arm locking those are the four ways you can win um and i before you can be good at choking or good at ar- doing arm bars in judo you have to know how to control somebody's position and you have to know how to isolate particular joints like i think somewhere danaher defines jiu-jitsu as a um the science of control leading to submission Something like that. It sounds very Danaher. Right. And um, and so before you can submit, you have to be able to control. Right. Yeah. To control, you have to pin. Right. Um, so I think at the white belt level, learning how to fall and pinning is really, really important. Uh, progressing to the yellow belt, I think that's where you have to start learning basic entry level techniques. 
pretty much in isolation. Learn your ogoshi, your hip throw, learn your osotogari, maybe learn your seoinage, and practice it, right? By about the green belt level, you should start being able to put individual techniques you learn in isolation into a larger network of techniques. So you can see how all the techniques are interrelated with one another, okay? And then by the time you get to brown belt, that's when you should be trying to um, develop a personalized game based on your, you know, your physical attributes, your personality, uh, your interests in the sport or the martial art, and kind of constantly uh, recalibrating and reassessing what you're good at, how linking together different combinations of techniques, all of which belong in your network of techniques, and then you know progressing to the black belt level. But like the hardcore rondori, you know, the rondori is what we use for stand up rolling, right? Stand up grappling. Mm -hmm. That's going to really start to kind of crystallize at the kind of advanced green belt and your brown belt levels. So you the, you really are spend a good number of years refining things before mm -hmm. you before the percentage of time you spend actually sparring kicks in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like if you go to like a really good judo club, usually the colored belts like in a class, they'll be doing techniques. Um and a little bit of rondori at the end, but the black belts will just come in, or the advanced brown belts and the black belts will come in, and they'll just do uchikomi in the corner, fit-ins, for like an hour while the colored belts are learning techniques, and then once rondori hits, that's when the live grappling goes. Tell me what a fit-in is. Oh, so uchikomi, I think it means literally striking against in Japanese, but it, colloquially we call them like fits or fit-ins. It's just where you fit... The, like the first two steps of every throw continuously with precision so as to refine technique and to increase your 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 cardio so that's stepping in and turning your hips into their yeah. hips and then snapping back out, yeah doing it and again and over, and back over, out, and over and over and over yeah. and over and depending upon your club and and the type of person you are you can do a hundred to a thousand uchikomi per practice mm -hmm. you just do mm -hmm. a lot what's your advice for the black belt level in judo the advice for the black belt level. Uh, How long have you been a black belt in judo? Long time. I don't know, like 20 years or something. It's okay. been a long time, yeah. yeah. So you qualify to give advice to the black belt level. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I've had uh, a couple brand, quote unquote, brand new black belts and stuff. And they're yeah. like, ah, I don't really feel qualified yeah. to say. Oh, fair yeah. enough. I think um, a lot of rondori, not necessarily competition. Not everybody is into competing for whatever reason. But what you do need to be proficient at judo is you have to be good at rondori. Um, and you can do that by rondoring in your own club and just traveling to other clubs and doing rondori with, with other judoka and at other dojos. That's really, really key is the rondori. So, and, and in fact, um, so the founder of judo, Jigoro Kano, thought that there were two components to judo training. Kata, which is like prearranged stuff, and rondori. Rondori is the, literally it means something like preparation for battle, preparation for war, one of my students told me. But it really, it's just like live training, grappling, that sort of thing. And that's where he thought the essence of judo was really practice. It was in the live training. And so if you want to get good at judo, you've got to do lots of rondori. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much that whole answer parallels to jujitsu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like even the... Even yeah. The step by step, kind of the same mm -hmm. philosophical components there, it seems mm -hmm. like. Yeah. 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 Good foundations are important. Yeah. And do it. Yeah. And do it. Yeah. Like, like yeah. actually do yeah. it. Do yeah. the live rolling or whatnot. Yeah. 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 Do you uh, plan on being a black belt in Jiu Jitsu? Oh, yes. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> kind of a joke of a question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've got my two stripes and my brown belt. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting a black belt. Why? Uh, I like pursuing excellence. So, um, I, uh, you know, I'm a professionally, I'm a scholar of, you know, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. And uh, the Greco Roman philosophers place human excellence at the forefront of, of, of living, of living purposefully, living meaningfully. And that's always uh, been very attractive to me the idea of the pursuing excellence, not only in a particular domain, uh, but also excellence at being human, right? And so martial arts training provides you with an opportunity to pursue excellence in a given domain. 
uh, and I find that very attractive. Why? Uh, cause I think it brings out the best of oneself, right? To be in pursuit of a thing and the excellence of a thing. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think of what it's in. Think of what's involved in um, mastering or perfecting or improving a martial art. You know, it takes. Um, uh, one has to constantly have uh, techniques and principles and concepts at the forefront of your mind. One has to constantly have the aims of the martial art in mind. One has to constantly progress towards this ideal end so that you're constantly trying to improve yourself, constantly uh, recalibrating what you're doing, constantly examining what you're doing so that you're, you're pursuing excellence in this art and this style. And in the process of doing so, you're also learning much more about yourself, right? Learning how you function under pressure, learning how you function when you face adversity, learning how you function when you achieve certain levels of proficiency. It's a, an exercise in pursuing excellence, but it's also an exercise in self-understanding or self-knowledge. So that's why I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity in martial arts. I'm doing a little uh, introspection as I listen to your answer there. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. But I, I feel called out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, you compete much? Not anymore. Yeah, I competed but... a lot when I was young, a lot. I was uh, constantly at tournaments, traveling to and fro. Um, but I haven't really competed since I left graduate school. In fact, I haven't competed at all since I left grad school in Philly. I just once I once I became a professional philosopher, I just thought I just don't have the time or the interest. I remember I start I was coaching some some people um, back when I was at Midway. And I remember driving five hours to a tournament location. I remember spending over six hours in a high school gymnasium to coach my then partner. And she had less than five minutes of mat time. And then we waited several more hours before we left and then had a five hour long commute. And I just thought, I've basically just blown an entire weekend, right, for five minutes of of, of fighting you know it's just like i just i just can't i can't do that anymore yeah. you're either into that or you're <laughs> yeah. not into you're that. not yeah and when you're not into that recognize it yeah and yeah. move on yeah so yeah. i get it if 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 you're if you're coming into formation as a martial artist mm -hmm. and it's important to you to compete you're gonna you're gonna do all the long road trips you're gonna hop on the planes you're gonna do it because it's important and it's fun uh but it's just that that aspect of martial arts is no longer my thing yeah I'm kind of there with with athletic competition in general. Mm -hmm. Actually, I coach people into powerlifting still, and and, uh -huh. and and I get a kick out of it. Uh -huh. But holy crap, if it ain't eight hours in a high school gymnasium for three attempts of three lifts, yeah. the actual action, if you set out the warm up, yeah, is a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. And I'm not there, yeah. but I'm starting to see that man. I I could really see. Yeah. being sort of done doing that you know <laughs> yeah i still enjoy it but yeah. i'm starting to see the light a little bit you yeah know? yeah and it, i think that's just one of those you know personal tests of just realizing when you're you're at, a, at the precipice of a thing and ready to move on yeah. or whatever so yeah, yeah, good, yeah good for you for not like <laughs> lingering and dragging it and... yeah 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 but i enjoyed my days when i competed i, I enjoyed it, it pretty good, good. Yeah, you yeah. pretty good at, at, at judo and yeah, the I was good. I was a good competitor. I, I I did well locally and regionally. I mm -hmm. never competed at nationals, which is really the major tournament in the mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. if, if you could win your division at nationals, it means you're very good. I never competed nationally, so I never tested myself in that regard. Sure. Uh, but I was good regionally, locally, regionally. Yeah. What did you like about competing when you did it? Um, this is one of those questions yeah. I ask, and I know the answer, yeah. but I'm going to ask it anyway. I love winning. Uh, and, uh, I love, I love competing against another human being. I love testing myself physically in relation to another man. There's just to me that there's something so primal about mm -hmm. me knowing that when I square off against you, I walk away with a W. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just naturally very competitive. I got to say that having rolled with you a couple of times now. Not a lot, but I've had two roles. That sounds right. Oh, does it really? That, okay. I, that's that's right. the vibe I got. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> My man here really likes doing this. <laughs> and he yeah. likes this feeling. Yeah, it's what, funny. It's what drives me. It's what keeps me going. I mean, I'm 44 and I've been doing martial arts since I was five. So, you know, something's got to keep you going. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, best, this is feeling like an interview with this dumb question. I don't like interviews, but uh, best story, best memory from competition days in judo? Oh. Like best. biggest win, happiest win, something like that. You know, the most, I don't know, I, I think the most memorable moment of competing, uh, <laughs> when I was really young, I remember I came in for a throw and I got countered. And it was against a, a, a bigger boy. I was a boy then. And I was afraid to fight him because he was bigger. And when I came in for the throw, I didn't fully commit. Maybe this is why I'm so big on commitment. Um, I didn't fully commit to my throw. And he countered me big time and just threw me flat on my back. And it hurt. But more importantly, my ego was mm. crushed. Mm. And I cried hysterically. Mostly because I was embarrassed, yeah. um, and I, I couldn't take that feeling of losing in front of the crowd sure. and losing in front of my father. Uh, and so I remember that moment of fearing your opponent, not fully committing to a technique because you fear your opponent, and losing because of it. Yeah. So uh, thank you for providing me yeah. with the opportunity to circle back to this commitment. That's why I'm so big on this. Problem. Slightly therapeutic moment <laughs> yeah, here. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Like, no wonder I'm all about commitment. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Hair Dr. Freud. Thank you very yeah. much for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Would you compete in jujitsu? Jujitsu is kind of your primary focus. When I, you, now it's my sole focus. Yeah. My training is all jujitsu. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I've got this thing. <laughs> and it's um it's nothing against jujitsu the art of jitsu jujitsu per se or jujitsu practitioners mm -hmm. and i think it's less of a thing now for me now that i'm much more comfortable starting from my butt uh, and i have much more of an appreciation of what it means to start from a sitting position but i would be very frustrated if somebody pulled guard on me <laughs> right and and i think i would lose a lot of motivation to compete against somebody if they just walked up to me and sat down. Um, and for that reason, motivationally, I don't have the desire to compete in jiu-jitsu because I think I'm likely to encounter people who won't stand with me and will just want to sit on their butt. And for some reason, that doesn't that doesn't motivate me to want to compete in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, that's why I've never really done it. Because your best tools wouldn't be available to you. No, it's not because my best uh, tools wouldn't be available to me, but like what makes it fun sure. is the fact that we're trying to throw each other. No, that's judo. <laughs> exactly. It's true. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Hold that's on. true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it yeah. can be what makes yeah. it fun. Yeah. But part uh, of me thinks that like my opponent needs to earn the right to be on the mat with me. I like the romance in that. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a purity there and some yeah. romance. I, I follow you. Yeah. Yeah. I follow you. Yeah. And, and if, you know, and if they can't get me to the ground, why am I going to the ground with them? This is the kind of well, conversation. I and, have and you know, if it's all an allegory for like a real fight. Mm hmm. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. 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 Why, why would I start crawling around on the ground with you? Yeah. yeah. Get me there. I like yeah. that actually. Yeah. But so I'm, you go ahead. Go but ahead. I'm becoming, I think that's becoming less of a thing with me now, now that I've really devoted myself to developing a guard, in my case, butterfly guard. Um, so now I have much more of an appreciation of that. And I'm yeah. starting to follow the the matches of of practitioners who actually don't do takedowns and are known for just pulling guard and working from there. So now that I'm better at this art and I appreciate it for what it is in its own right, that's less of a thing for me now. Sure. Yeah. He's scared. <laughs> uh what, what what what's your game in jujitsu? What do you like? You say butterfly guard. Butterfly guard, yeah. So I've so you like big guy judo. Mm -hmm. I don't perceive butterfly guard as being like you see a lot of bigger guys. Well, yeah, no. It's, I think in part because Marcelo Garcia popularized it. Yeah. But one of the leading um, practitioners of butterfly guard now is Adam Wazinski, and he's a heavyweight, big, sure. tall, lanky Polish guy. Yeah. Um, 
and he's somebody whose kind of career I'm following now because we have similar body types and he's good at butterfly guard. The reason why I like butterfly guard is because it feels like judo to me. It took me a while to figure out, like, how do I develop a game that feels like judo for me? <laughs> and um, there are throws in judo um, that are very similar to your standard hook sweep in butterfly guard. Um, and that's called sumigaishi. It's where you like you grab your partner's sleeve and then you pull them across your body and you reach and you grab their opposite hip and then you insert your near leg in their far leg and you flip them over uh, your shoulder. Mm -hmm. That throw, which I like in judo, I mimic when I'm doing butterfly guard. So it was just a way about translating the proprioception involved in judo to jiu-jitsu and now it's starting to click for me like i used to just learn techniques in isolation right and and i wouldn't um put them together into a network of techniques mm -hmm. uh, but now that i've really devoted myself to butterfly guard um things are really um improving for me and it's getting very interesting and i really like it nice what what uh what's your least favorite guard then Maybe which one feels the least like judo? Um, uh, the one that feels least like judo. Hmm. Hard to say. I think, um, well, you know. Well, I, I guess what I mean by that is the butterfly yeah. started making sense when you sort yeah. of intuited it next, yeah. next to some of those judo fundamentals. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like closed guard, is that yeah. is that something I'm going to land in? If... Well, closed guard is something I fall into when I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think know, that's what I'm it's for. Being, I'm just being I think that's lazy. what it's for, actually. And I'm just being yeah. lazy and I, want, and I need 30 seconds to yeah. rest, right. which happens more often these days. <laughs> um, um, you know, some of the other guards, you know, like, I don't know, like 50-50 or something like that, uh, th that doesn't... Um, appeal to me so much as a martial artist although i'm learning leg locks from 50 50 for marcus right now and it's fa it's eye-opening and it's really interesting and fascinating it's just not something that i would ever do yeah. i think in a match it's or... not pure it's yeah. filthy <laughs> yeah yeah it's dark it's filthy. lethal yeah yeah but yeah. it's not pure yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's funny yeah. i'll just say something else about butterfly card anything yeah. one of the things i like about butterfly guard too is the grip fighting you do from the sitting position uh, is very similar to judo. So like in the thick of the battle of the set, when I'm seated with both of my hooks in, I'm in a nice tight acute angle and I'm grappling for position, I'm basically going for sleeves, going for elbows, going for collar, going for the top part. And it feels like I'm doing judo, except now I'm, I'm seated. So that's one of the other reasons I like it. It's like you could do like aggressive grip fighting from that position, which yeah. I like. And it's the thing I like about this comparison and this like equivalency is it's you don't have nearly as far to go mm -hmm. to hit the ground. No, 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 you don't. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure when you key eyed me and swept me the other day, it was from butterfly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was like I can deal with that. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a small little thing. Just, yeah. whoop, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so, no big deal. Yeah, that's the value of starting seated. Yeah. Uh, what is the phrase you use mm -hmm. or the word you say when you you are sounding your barbaric yelp? Oh and, yeah, and key eye. You know, it's 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 a it's um. I think I've used different key eyes over different eras of my life. I, I used to train at Midway for about six years when I first got here. And one of my training partners, who's a very good judoka, his name is Jared Yamanaka, uh, he and his brothers had a, a certain way of ki-eyeing. And over time, I think my ki eye morphed in ways that is similar to theirs. So it'll usually sound something like, Aisha, like that. <laughs> and, you know, the more I need to expend more energy, the louder uh, it, it will get. Mm. Sometimes it's very subtle. Other times it's basically a scream. That was not nearly as terrifying <laughs> as it sounds <laughs> as you're floating briefly through uh, the air. Yeah on the mats well that's one of the differences <laughs> between brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo or brazilian jiu-jitsu and karate or even muay thai you don't hear ki eyes uh in, in jiu-jitsu academies you know everybody's kind of quiet looking for position looking for leverage you yeah. know but in 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 arts where you have to generate a lot of force very quickly to execute a technique you often need 
two ki. Right. Um, just like in powerlifting, I was going to. You're going to draw that equivalent. You're generating a yeah. lot of force under a lot of weight very quickly, yeah. and sometimes you've got to scream yep. to to get that weight up. So uh, and you don't even try sometimes. Yeah. 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 You know what the ki is in powerlifting? What? What, what you say? What? Up. Oh, up, up, up. Yeah. Like the whole room screams it, but yeah. you're going, ah, it's, yeah. it's kind of this abbreviated yeah. up. Uh, the big fella at M Theory, the white belt, Nick. Nick, yeah. He's got uh, some years of judo. Yeah, he's red belt judo. He's a, he's a buddy of mine from way, way back. Oh, like okay. college days. Oh, really? And uh, we both enjoy enjoyed martial arts. He was more involved in it because I was all in on the meathead stuff. Yeah. Strongman competitions uh-huh. and whatnot. But we... We would use a key eye uh, in like regular life situations. Yeah. Swing the microwave clothes, you know, key eye. <laughs> but we would say key eye. That yeah. was the key eye. Key yeah. eye. Yeah. That's why I asked if there was a specific word or mm. phrase or sound that sort of organically came out. Yeah. Different styles have different sounds. You know, um, like if you go into a, a Muay Thai academy and like they're always hitting the pads going, ish, 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 you know, yeah. and it really depends. Yeah. That's reasonably prevalent. Mm-hmm. You, you need to make noise yeah. to create force yeah. and do it fast. Yeah, you do. I'm yeah. just thinking through all the sports. Yeah. Tennis. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. Oh, tennis. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of grunting yeah. in tennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah. it really isn't that moment very often other than like a, a big sweep or something mm-hmm. on, on the jiu-jitsu mats. Yeah. Even in jiu-jitsu, I think I only do it because I'm a judoka. But, you know, an art that focuses so much on like connection and stickiness and leverage you uh, it's just a totally different skill set that you don't really need the key eye to execute it right because if you're just in the ideal position all that's needed is a small shift of the hips and the partner goes over like i was rolling with ethan uh the black belt m theory the Mm -hmm. other day and somehow unconsciously i just put myself on top of him in the precise position he needed to sweep me and he just effortlessly swept me. And I was just like, I can't believe I just did that. Yeah. <laughs> there was no key I needed because the position was perfect yeah. and it was a sweep by means of leverage. Ugh. So <laughs> it's deception. <laughs> yeah. Recommend a book for just in general reading. Um, well, um, take that any direction you want. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about judo, sure. um, I'll say, um, a good book to read that combines a lot of things that I'm into, um, is Jigoro Kano's book called Mind Over Muscle. It's a very small book, um, widely available. Uh, and it basically expresses the history and philosophy behind judo. And so it'll tell you a little bit about him as a person. It'll tell you about all the different threads that came together to produce judo and why. And it'll give you an insight into Japan, you know, at the at the turn of the 20th century. That's a really excellent little book. I actually teach it in my Zen in the Art of Judo course. My students get a real kick out of that. It's a great book. Mind over muscle. Do you have to be uh, enrolled as a student to take your class? <laughs> Some faculty have requested to take it. I've never gotten around to doing it. Um, but yeah, all the students, you have to be a student. Yeah. I can't, I can't just come down and <laughs> spot you 20 bucks or something. And <laughs> the students be like, who's this big, strong guy? <laughs> Flying through the air because yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, I'm looking at your body type and I'm thinking like what kind of throws you would be interested in. And if you have a powerlifting background and you're good at generating force... I think, you know, good solid Ogoshi, Koshi Garuma, Harai Goshi, these techniques are should be in your arsenal. Should I write that down? <laughs> That's recording. We'll be okay. Uh, why? Because uh, you can translate the physical movements of powerlifting into those techniques. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the foot sweeps would be good, too. I mean, yeah. I think for jiu-jitsu, like, foot sweeps are really, really good. Um, but for your body type and your skill set and your natural abilities... Like those would be really. They'll get me to mount as soon as possible. They'll get you to mount as soon as possible, and if you throw it correctly, (laughs) you'll the person will land, and your legs will clear their legs, so you won't have to worry about passing guard. Yes, because I'm terrible at that, Mm. so that's good. Yeah. When your when your your game is centered around 
having mounted someone, mm-hmm. but you're not good at everything you need to do to get there. To get there, yeah, yeah. Oh, do you like mounting? Is that the position you like? Bro, <laughs> just like your appraisal of the judo situation, <laughs> it seems like the natural way to go. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> And all that is is yeah. going, okay, I don't want to actually have to get good at stuff. So mm-hmm. I have a, a natural uh, skill set for this. So I'm mm-hmm. just going to chase what I'm theoretically already sort of good at. Yeah. I'm being yeah. a bad student. Uh. I do like Mount, though. I don't yeah. know. It, it, it makes sense more than, despite, you know, setting aside the 300-pound element of it. It just makes, uh. I don't know, the stuff makes sense yeah. from there, the arm locks and whatever. Yeah. How much do you weigh? Uh, like a little under 280 right now. Oh, okay, actually. okay, uh, okay. We're getting skinny. <laughs> we're going down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Getting skinny and weak in our in our late 30s here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something I was going to ask you about Mount. I don't remember. What? Favorite techniques for Mount? How to escape from Mount? Uh, that was, I think that's the only thing I've done well with mm-hmm. jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Like very early on, there's a, I don't know if you've met Zach Jeffrey yet. He's oh a, yeah, He's okay, great, great jujitsu player. Um, very early on, he asked me what I wanted to be good at in jujitsu, mm-hmm. and I said escapes, mm-hmm. just because I I was like you know, yeah. three weeks or whatever into just sucking, yeah, and just yeah. hating, yeah, and, just and just being smashed, smashed, and just going, I'm the biggest <laughs> dude here. What's the deal, man? <laughs> yeah. This is not how this is supposed to go, you know. Uh, and yeah. I was honestly it's still. Yeah, you know, like I'll, I'll even start rounds in disadvantageous spots. And yeah. Stuff. Like I don't really care. Yeah. I'm not going to go compete. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I'm having fun drilling Barambolo. Cause, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, that's yeah. hilarious looking, seeing me, <laughs> yeah. seeing these people get lifted way up in the air as yeah. I as I go under them. Yeah. But like the, the fundamental, to your point, like can you land? Can you escape? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like what a skill, mm-hmm. you know, to be able mm-hmm. to trip and fall and mm-hmm. land safely or sure. get shoved and land safely. Yeah. And then to, in that same awful situation, find yourself under somebody mm-hmm. or in some disadvantageous spot and be able to get out. Mm-hmm. That's what I like about jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I'm not going to arm bar anybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, you will, but. Well, preferably not. Uh-huh. But if I can get out of their control yeah. and get them under mine, uh-huh. which in, in my head is mount. Yeah. That's what that's for. Uh-huh. Those are the skills I want. I yeah. want to be able to get out and I want to be able to hold you down. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 You don't like going for submissions then? I do, but, and I was just thinking about this the other day, like I, I started a round with a cat who's relative, like an equal round. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we slapped hands, I, I he essentially just stepped into my half guard mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm going to keep you here. Mm-hmm. I went like Z guard, knee shield kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to keep you here this whole round. Mm-hmm. I didn't say that out loud, but that was my goal. Mm-hmm. And once he passed that, I wanted to sweep back to it or get back to it. Mm-hmm. And if I needed to get to mount, I wasn't thinking about arm bars or yeah. chokes yeah, yeah, or, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like yeah. if I can hold you in mount for four minutes, mm-hmm. odds are I can work on yeah. taking an arm or yeah, you know, sure, getting a yeah. choke if I yeah. need to. Yeah. So it was like three minutes of, of my half guard. Uh, he passed. I wound up in his half guard. He got a submission. Mm. Really deep Ezekiel choke. Mm. Like, high five, buddy. Nice yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, and then I quick swept from half, got into mountain, just rode mount, mm-hmm. you know, arms above his head for yeah. nice. n- another three minutes. Nice. And again, it's like if I can control you and yeah. not let you control me. Mm-hmm. That's what I want out of jujitsu. Yeah. You know? Well, good for you to have that that mentality of not caring about winning, uh, well, training, uh, an ordinary practice that can be very liberating. If you just yeah. say, "I'm going to start off in a disadvantageous position so I can work on something," if I end up getting submitted or getting dominated, big deal. Who cares? I'm working on my techniques. Yeah. That's how you learn. Yeah. And you can learn at a much faster rate than if you're just like, oh, I just want to smash people. And <laughs> yeah. I, d- I definitely don't have that. <laughs> I apologize all the time. Like, oh, sorry, man. <laughs> what? That was good. Yeah, but it just seemed rude, you know, <laughs> yeah. choking you. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's also kind of cringe, mm-hmm. you know, like when somebody at my level, like you guys are blue belts and like hardcore getting in and you know trying to nail submissions and mm. like, yeah <laughs> calm down bro <laughs> you know? yeah we're just training we're just <laughs> that's training. exactly it yeah. Yeah, yeah cool man i am pretty happy with this okay all right nice well thank you very much yeah give me one of these through yeah. the mics <laughs> thanks brother yeah thank you it's fun